Hello, and welcome to Money Talks from Sleep Money. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios, and I'm here with Bianca Bosca. Thank you. It's happy to be here. Bianca, introduce yourself. Who are you? I'm Bianca Bosker. I'm an author and a journalist. I'm a contributing writer at The Atlantic Magazine, the author of the book Cork Dork, and the author most recently of the book Get the Picture. So for your first book about the wine world, you immersed yourself in the wine world, and it's all very first person and all about how you learned about it. This book is basically the same, only it's about the art world, and you immersed yourself by working with gallerists, you worked with Julie Curtis, who's quite a famous artist, you worked at a very famous museum, the Guggenheim. So we're going to talk about all of that coming up on Sleep Money. Slate Money is sponsored this week by SAP Business AI. We've got some bad news. It won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. It will identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. It will automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. It's basically something that allows you to get ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. You were here in this very studio, I believe, when Cork Talk came out, and we had a great time talking about wine. And then you emailed me to say you were doing a follow-up about the only thing I love more than wine, which is art. And I'm like, okay, we need to get Bianca to come on and talk about art. And as you know, this is a money show. We're going to talk a little bit about the financial side of things because it's always pretty tight, right? I mean, there are a handful of famous gallerists, collectors, artists who seem to have millions of dollars. But you spent a lot of time in this world and it wasn't obvious that people were getting rich from it. Right. Well, I should say that, you know, so for me, this book was, first of all, similarly to Cork Dork, incredibly immersive. I mean, I threw myself in and, you know, I ended up working at galleries selling art. I was helping artists in their studios. I was working as a security guard at the Guggenheim and a lot more. But all of it is part of this journey to understand why does art matter and how do any of us engage with it more deeply? I certainly felt like I was not engaging with it deeply. And that was something that really began to bother me. And when I embarked on this journey, you know, I very quickly gravitated towards the up and coming side of it. You know, I think a lot of books, a lot of coverage tends to focus on the same big names, the big price tags. But to me, really, this up and coming side of the art world, you know, the term is emerging artists, is to me the highest stakes and least covered part of it. You know, these are artists who are you know, spending all their money on their studio and scrounging on their own rent so they wake up covered in cat pee on a friend's couch. You know, these are gallerists who are maxing out credit cards to show hunks of sculpture they believe can change the world. These are people who are, you know, doing mental math to figure out if they can afford a bagel, but doing it because they believe so passionately in what art does for our lives. And I couldn't see that. I think I really couldn't see that from the get-go. And so that was what possessed me to throw myself in. Right. This is not the, you know, fake Leonardo's of selling for $400 million. This is not Larry Gagosian's private jet. This is the ground level of where art history begins. And that, I think, is so interesting. I think we hear a lot about um, the sort of fairy tale of how it happens. You know, the conquering heroes like to tell us that the process by which an artist goes from, you know, unknown uh, individual to, you know, celebrated genius is flawless and works perfectly every time. But it's a mess, really. I, I don't think anyone says that. <laughs> but, but, I mean, statistically speaking, if you look back on art history, and there's a lot of it, it goes back for many centuries, For most of it, in most decades, there will be, I don't know, three or four like great artists who stand the test of time. And you are here in the emerging contemporary art world looking at hundreds, thousands of artists who, statistically speaking, probably zero of them are going to wind up standing the test of time and being remembered in 200 years' time. In order to understand how to look at things, in order to understand what art can really do, Wouldn't it make more sense to 
look at the stuff that everyone understands is unambiguously great rather than a lot of stuff that might be just here today and gone tomorrow? So backing up a bit, you know, I think that for me, where I started this journey was really from a place of of ignorance, really. I mean, you know, I felt like I didn't understand how to do art, right? I would go to galleries and museums and I felt like I was, you know, two tattoos and a master's degree away from figuring out what was going on. And it wasn't until I actually discovered this trove of drawings by my grandmother, actually inspired by her time as a Holocaust survivor in a displaced persons camp after the war, that I began to ask myself some rather difficult questions about why I felt like art wasn't an important part of my life. And I started trying to reconnect. You know, it had been a while since I had worked up the guts to go and really see art on a regular basis. And so I tried again. I thought I was older. I was wiser. And in fact, I was not any wiser. I still didn't figure out what was going on. But the people around it really enthralled me. I mean, their level of obsession, as I mentioned before, you know, I'd never met a group of people that was willing to sacrifice so much for something of so little obvious practical value. And I just got obsessed. Or financial value for that matter. Right. Or financial, right. But I mean, financial is practical, I think, right? <laughs> it does buy you things like shelter and food. And I just, my mind kept turning and turning around this question of, you know, why does art matter and how can any of us get more out of it? How can I get more out of it? And at the same time, these people had really behaved like they'd accessed these trap doors in their brains. I mean, their reality operated according to totally different rules of nature that I was not used to experiencing. And it made my own existence feel very claustrophobic. And so I think that it just lodged this nugget, it lodged this seed in my brain that convinced me that I needed to figure out if I could see not only art, but also the the world the way that they did. This this makes perfect sense, actually, because you've been going to galleries and museums all your life. And it's perfectly possible for or people... Being, or being you know, dragged to them. Or, or going dragged. because it was the polite thing yeah. to do. And, and it's possible to do that, you know, ad nauseum without getting anywhere. Clearly, if you're going to be devoting your life to something, there's some way of looking, some way of seeing that makes it all worthwhile. And... If you hang out with those people who look and see in that way, then you, well, I mean, spoiler alert, ended up kind of learning what it was that they were doing, what it was that they were seeing. But it took you a while to get there. It took me a while to get, I mean, getting access in the art world was the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in my career as a journalist. I mean, I've done reporting in China, which is not an easy place to be a journalist. And you know, getting access in Chengdu is nothing compared to Chelsea, let me tell you. And that also was intriguing to me. I was going in with what I thought were rel relatively basic questions. You know, how do you do art, right? Like, why are you doing this? Like, why does this matter? And even to these questions, you know, people were throwing up walls. I mean, I got threats. I had, you know, people telling me that if I knew it was good for me, I would back away now. People going off the record at every turn to share, you know, pretty anodyne platitudes. Utterly benign. Yes, yeah. it happens. This is the, the first rule of the art world is people like swear you to secrecy and then tell you something. It's a, yeah. Utterly banal, right? Utterly banal. <laughs> and you're like, why? And the answer to the to that question or that question of, of why are people so scared? Why is it so opaque? I'm, I'm interested in because I have, I've always had two different theories about this. One is just to kind of preserve a sense of mystery around the whole thing. But the other one is more financial. The other one is the, especially when it comes to art galleries and art dealers, they make all of their money or most of their money from secrets, from information asymmetry. They make their money because they know who the collectors are and what the collectors own and what the collectors want and what they want to buy and what they want to sell. And that information is how you make money in the art world as a as a gallery. And what you need in order to be successful is to have information that no one else has, or at the very least, a, an artist that no one else has and, and that people want. And so it's all about these kind of rival goods, these things where like, only I can have it and you can't have it. And that good is often just information. So people are naturally incredibly secretive, although they are also naturally, as you will attest, insanely gossipy. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, I would also expand on that. I mean, I came to think that that secrecy stems, first of all, from 
like you said, the art world's tendency to wield strategic snobbery at every turn, right? There is this idea that through the secrecy, you build mystique. And I tend, I came away from this experience thinking that that's unnecessary. I do think that art, the power of art, can stand alone on its own two feet without all the velvet ropes and made-up language. I think the other part of it that you didn't mention is that there is this sort of mafia-like omerta that exists as well, where there are things that go on in the art world that would pass for insane, absurd, criminal, just about anywhere else. And if you don't swear an oath of silence to maintain that secrecy, you're considered a risk. And so as someone uh, coming in, you know, as a journalist, which I am, um, wanting to talk about what goes on, that was not always welcome. Okay, so let's let's rip off the the veil of secrecy since we have nothing we have we have no reason to protect these folks i think i hear this a lot there's there's stuff that goes on in the art world that would you know shock you to your core and i always kind of struggle a bit with what is it is it money laundering or is it like tax evasion this all seems a little bit picky right i mean i think you know, as someone, in one of my sources described to me, it's like the art world sort of takes the world and just magnifies it, right? It's like things that go on. It's this total universe of extremes, right? I mean, look at the extremes of wealth, for example. I mean, look at the, you know, importance of privilege, of connections. I mean, sort of the things that go on in the, in the everyday world also go on in the art world, but to this kind of heady extreme. One of my reasons for putting myself in the center of the action and learning by doing was that I really wanted to understand the decisions that get made around the art. I really wanted to see how does an artwork go from being the germ of an idea in someone's studio to this masterpiece that we fawn over at a museum. And that's because I think that all the decisions that shape an artwork are ultimately decisions that shape us, right? Our idea of why does art matter? Why do we bother to engage with it? Who makes it? What art is fundamentally, which is not an easy question. Um, And I do think that getting a front row seat, you know, it's one thing to understand these things in generalities, but for me, I found it really eye-opening to have a direct glimpse at these things happening in action. So, for example, um, I ended up working with a gallery, uh, Denny Dimon, and going with them to sell art during the Bacchanal that is Art Basel, Miami Beach. And during the VIP day, there was a museum curator who had a gaggle of donors that he took around the fair and, you know, they stopped them by our booth and, you know, explained the artwork to them. Then he took them to the next one. Um, And later that afternoon, one of the donors came by our booth and basically said, "Um, you know, we'll, I'll take two editions of the same photograph. So the same photo, just, you know, Two different pe- on two, two different pieces of paper, essentially. And I want you to ship one of them to the museum and I want you to ship one of them to me. And I found just bearing witness to that something that really transformed my understanding of the way that collecting works, of the way that museums work. I mean, there's nothing criminal about that. As people like to say, insider trading is totally legal in the art world. But nonetheless, there's something that I found uh, off-putting about that. This idea that philanthropy in the art world, for example, you know, it's a nice way of saying a little bit of a polite corruption, right? I mean, in the so, sense so that buying an artwork for a museum is going to inherently make its value go up. And now you own that photograph. So the value of the photograph that you own also goes up. And of course, that's just one example of many and, and one occurrence of many that goes on all, all over. Quick break and we'll be straight back. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So, just like your favorite podcast, Late Money, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. 
Discounts not available in all states and situations. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Wondery, which is the company that makes the Business Wars podcast. The global smartwatch industry is worth $45 billion a year. It's enormous. And the undisputed bestseller in that industry is the Apple Watch. But Apple's dominance was not always a given. Samsung was ready to capitalize on the uncertainty at Apple following the death of Steve Jobs and was, in 2013, an electronics powerhouse. So Business Wars from Wondery is all about the Samsung versus Apple fight. Follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. The slogan I like to trot out is is that collectors collect art and museums collect collectors. Mm. <laughs> because museums in general, especially in America, are not rich. They don't have a lot of money on their own or of their own. And especially smaller ones are quite acquisitive. They want to acquire more art. And so what they do is they get board members who who are rich to give them money. But one of the things about being a board member is you have control over what the museum does. And of course, what that board member is going to do is encourage the museum to buy the kind of art that they like. Or vice versa, or or collect the kind of art that the museum likes that they now own and appreciates and value. Yeah, I think I think it's more I mean, one of the things that does tend to happen is that museums wind up being filled with the kind of art that rich white billionaire men like, because rich white billionaire men are the kind of people who give a lot of money to museums. And you spend a lot of time in, you know, the emerging art world in downtown New York and Brooklyn, where there are very few rich white billionaire men, and it's it's very diverse and very woke, and the vast majority of artists and galleries in that world are, you know, never going to make a huge amount of money and be successful financially in that sense. And there comes a point, I think, when you start spending a bit of time in the art world, you start realizing that the kind of acclaim that surrounds artists and art that appear in museums and that sell for enormous amounts of money is not entirely or even mostly a function of some kind of inherent quality, but it's just a function of this is the kind of thing that rich people like to buy. And then everything kind of sort of trickles down from there. And you, I think one of the great things about your book is that you, you know, develop an eye and you start appreciating stuff. Often it might not be for sale at all. One of the things that drew me into this world was this idea of developing an eye. And an eye in the art world isn't just an organ, right? It's considered this, you know, capital E I, right? This painstakingly cultivated outlook that allegedly enables you to see a lot that doesn't need the eye, like who's going to be the next Andy Warhol or, you know, what's transcendent about a sculpture of limp vegetables on a stained mattress. And I eventually got brought on as an assistant at a gallery right around the corner from here, actually, where my boss, Jack, um, really seemed to share my concern that I was, uh, you know, an uncultivated rube and kind of helped make it his (laughs) joint mission to help me build my eye. And what I found really surprising is that so much of the information that I thought was extraneous data that shouldn't affect my view of an artwork, you know, where the artist went to school, who owned their work, who they dated, who their friends were. All of that information, I thought, really should have no bearing on my experience of an artwork. I was quickly made to understand, in fact, is crucial to fully appreciating an artwork. In other words, that having an eye among connoisseurs in this day and age means having an eye for context, where context means sort of that web of names that surrounds a work, right? Again, what museums have shown it, who owns it, what galleries have shown it, where the name of the grad school they went to, who the artist is friends with, all that. And we can talk about the art historical reasons why that's become the case, why context has become so important in this day and age. To be clear, it is also kind of bullshit. I mean, it does. it is true in a certain part of a certain subset of the art world. Yeah, well, I think also this idea that you can't fully understand an artwork without understanding its context 
also almost definitionally creates the need for experts to tell you what you're looking at, right? It sort of creates this idea that like, oh, you need a professional, you need a gallerist, you need a chaperone to be able to have a relationship with art, right? Like you can't just go out and look at things on your own. No, no, no. And that also didn't sit well with me. And so I ended up going and it was really later when I um, spent time working as a studio assistant to the artist Julie Curtis and also several other artists where I felt like I was able to finally like fan away that fog of context and look art in the eye and in the process develop my own eye. I came away from the experience thinking that, you know, when it comes to buying art, when it comes to appreciating art, developing your own eye is, first of all, the crucial first step. But that really happens between you and the artwork, right? I don't think that there's like everything you need to have a meaningful experience of art is there right in front of you with a piece. You know, you of course, that's not to say you can't understand new dimensions of it through art history or through, you know, reading about provenance or what have you. But, you know, working with Julie and being in her studio and and seeing the way that, first of all, art making is a much more athletic process than I think we give it credit for being, um, made me see that really just following the decisions that an artist made with a piece offers you a path into the work. And when I say that, what I mean is, when you go to galleries or museums, for the last 100 years or so, there's been this enormous emphasis on the idea that what really matters about an artwork is the idea behind it, right? The thought trumps the thing. We can talk about Marcel Duchamp and, you know, sort of his role in all of this. But what you get is, I think, this sort of dismissal of the physical craft, of the technical skill. I mean, there's this idea right now that teaching drawing is uh, an outdated skill. I remember there was a there's a administrator at an art school who dismissed teaching drawing as being this outdated skill. And as Julie said herself, an idea is not a painting. And being in her studio and watching as she, you know, literally wrestled with the materials, right? I mean, I got blistered and bloody. I lost patches of arm hair to a sculpture. I mean, putting an artwork together really is this exercise of wrestling with the elements, of wrestling with the forces of nature, of making things stick, stay, lie. And I think that at least transformed for me, my eye and my experience of looking at an artwork where now, you know, I go to a museum, I go to a gallery. And what I am focused on, like I said, is the decisions that an artist made. Each of those things, even if it appears sloppy, even if it appears slapdash, you know, those are decisions, right? Someone decided to leave that part of the canvas blank, decided to leave the drips of paint there. Uh, And there's a world that opens up in the life of an artwork when we let ourselves linger and focus on those. And I think also, I will say, I think developing our eye gets us away from the necessity of outsourcing our opinion to the hive mind, of outsourcing our idea of quality to the rich white billionaires, to the tiny posse of people who have made it their job, you know, to sort of decide what's important. You know, with our with an eye, we can decide that for ourselves. And you did talk a little bit about purchasing, and I want to, I did want to talk to you about this because it's it's really super fundamental to the whole world because ultimately all of the money in the art world in one way or another well except for maybe just you know gallerists who who lose their trust funds is coming from people buying art taking money and turning it into art and making those decisions and those people may or may not have you know ha- have a range of different tastes and eyes and all the rest of it But what they almost, without exception, do is they spend time with the art that they buy and they live with it and it grows on them over time and they learn to appreciate and and some pieces grow on them more than other pieces. And you have a long section of your book about spending, you know, hours in the Guggenheim Museum with certain pieces and just giving them lots and lots of time and letting the art reveal itself to you over time which almost perforce like it by necessity if you're an art collector has to happen after you've bought it i mean you know galleries will let collectors you know borrow a piece of art and put it above their sofa to see if it looks good for a couple days but ultimately that whole experience of living with something is only something that happens after you buy it and that is an interesting tension to me that you never really know when you buy an art how much, how how good it's going to turn out to be. (laughs) That's true. But I think that that idea of slow looking, while it's something that you can get 
by buying a piece of work, certainly you don't have to spend money on a piece of work to do that, right? I mean, so part of the reason I was attracted to working as a security guard at a museum was partially because I was very curious to know how would looking at art for hours and hours every day with no opportunity for escape change my relationship with the art. And it seems very obvious to say, like, well, you get more out of art if you spend more time looking at it. But the question then to me is, well, then why don't any of us do it, right? Like, there are studies that show that, you know, the average amount of time that a museum visitor spends looking at an artwork is something like, you know, eight seconds, and maybe four of those are reading the wall text, or we should say glancing at the wall text. And there's another study that found it was maybe 17 seconds. Um, but even that, I think, arguably skews high because that study only counted people that actually bothered to stop at an artwork. When I was working as a guard, I won't lie. I mean, there were times where it was deathly boring, right? Like, I would just pray that someone would try and touch an artwork so I could tell them not to, right? Like, I got so good at recognizing, like, the crinkle of a water bottle moments before it would open because you're just you're so alert. You're looking for things to do. Um, you know, I'd radio in a stray leaf just because something had to break the monotony. And I gradually started giving myself these looking exercises uh, to break up my time on post or in the vacuum, as we described it. And one of those was to spend 40 minutes, which was the time on one post before we rotated to the next one, was to spend that that full 40 minutes staring at one artwork. And I had never done that before. I mean, kudos to all of you out there that are much more disciplined and have, you know, have uncorrupted attention spans. But having spent, you know, many years of my life on the Internet, that wasn't me. And the only time that I had, you know, spent 40 minutes looking at a piece was never, basically. <laughs> you know, it took like the threat of getting fired and, you know, God knows how many security cameras to get me to do it. And while I what I found is that while I would give myself that exercise of looking at a piece for an uninterrupted 40 minutes, I kept challenging myself to notice something new. And I was surprised to find that with so many of these artworks, I could, right? I could keep looking. I could keep discovering something new after 40 minutes, after four days, after four weeks. And each time I came to them, they changed or I changed, but they weren't the same. And they just kept giving. And so I think that, you know, I haven't had the experience of spending you know, four decades living with a Picasso that, you know, I got from the studio. But I am here to say that I have spent, you know, four hours, probably 40 hours, right, with certain artworks. And there are those that begin to wear on you. There are those where you only keep falling further in love. And then there are those where, like with other humans, you have a really complicated relationship. And there were days where I just found myself, I mean, on a physical level, almost like, you know, to like a that like a lover where you get butterflies drawn to this horrendous Francis Bacon triptych uh, that was on one of the ramps. And then there were days where like it just turned my stomach to even look at it. And so, you know, I think there is this amazing opportunity for an evolving relationship with an artwork if you give it room. Have you purchased any art since you wrote the book or while writing the book or like in, in the wake of this immersion? Um, in terms of purchasing artwork, I tried to follow the guidelines that um, are set up for me as a journalist with the publications that I work for, which is, you know, to say that you don't want to be writing about things in which you have a financial value because it's a conflict of interest. And so I wasn't out shopping for artwork. But at the same time, I kept coming across almost on a daily basis works of art that I was just desperate to bring home with me. And that was also part of what changed for me. I think that you know, I'm a, I have become a huge advocate for the idea of really buying emerging artwork. And I think the the art world, the art industry is really, I don't have to tell you this, like a winner take all business model, right? There's a small number of people that make a lot of money. And yet there are way more people who deserve to be making a living from their artwork than are currently supported by the current system. And, you know, I think part of the reason for that comes from this outsourcing of our taste, from not taking the time to develop visual literacy, which was a huge complaint from artists I heard. You know, people were like, people are not looking. I kept hearing from artists, you know, we have to develop our visual literacy, not only to get more from art, but simply because not doing so, as they described it, is essentially an existential threat in an era where we're so bombarded with images. And it's true, right? I mean, we get images, you know, howling at us from Instagram. They're 
yelling at us from billboards. I mean, images surround us all the time and they're not neutral, right? They're all trying to influence us and get us to do something. And building your eye is one way to fight back against that. But I do think that I think another argument for each of us building our visual literacy is that maybe in the process we can build a better art industry. We can build a system where It's not a small number of people fighting over the same limited quantities of artwork, but where people can trust their own taste. They can have really their own personal relationship with artworks, independent of what gallerists or curators tell them what to like. And in the process, buy art or fairly support art with their attention from a much wider population of artists. And I I love this. I really, really love this idea. I think this is an awesome goal for everyone to have. Um, But it raises a couple of big questions, which I'd love to ask you. The first one is, let's say I'm out there and I've I've taken your advice and Bianca says I should go out and buy art from emerging artists. I'm going to do that. The first one is, given the way in which art evolves over time with looking at it and given how slowly art is, how, how slowly art reveals its secrets, um, and you, how you see things four years later that you never saw when you, you know, first looked at it. How do you know what's going to do that and what isn't? How do you stop yourself from buying something superficially clever but that has few, if any, secrets to reveal? I don't think you do. I think you make <laughs> mistakes. I think I said this is a question that I grappled with as well because I felt like. You know, I got to this point where I had basically turned my entire life over to art. I mean, I was working at a gallery several days a week, um, you know, spackling walls, writing press releases, selling art. I was doing studio visits. I was working at artist studios. I mean, I was a deadbeat to everyone that I loved in my life. And I really began to suffer this identity crisis in matters of taste, right? Because I did feel like there were so many things that I had always loved implicitly that suddenly I was questioning, right, whether it was like articles of clothing or some photographs that my husband and I bought on our honeymoon. And that was not a comfortable experience, right? It's not a great feeling to, you know, think that you've shelled out hard-earned money for things that you can no longer stand to be around. (laughs) Um, And I started to really wonder, you know, what is good art, right? Like, what is – how do we know? It is – personal and i love this idea of making mistakes and i love this idea of taste default which of course it does in wine as well almost no one loves the same wine at you know age 60 that they loved when they were 20 right but i think i came to see taste as less a goal and more as a journey right i think that there i came into it this idea of like there is a right answer right i will get the right (laughs) answer if i do my homework if i just talk to the right people if i like if I bring a painting under the harsh lights and like badger it with questions, like eventually it will re- reveal up the secret of whether it's good or bad. And was working with Julie, with, with the artist Julie Curtis, that really helped me understand that taste is not a destination. It's this continual exercise of just pushing yourself, of exposing yourself to new things, right? You know, she described this experience of developing new tastes as building a new self. And so I do think that when it comes to to buying art. First of all, I was under the impression that it was sort of impossible to buy art unless you were ready to take out a second mortgage. And in fact, it's not, right? There's many different places where you can buy art for $20, $150. Every place, everywhere from places like the Spring Break Art Fair, which features up and coming artists, to there's a, you know online galleries, uh, a lot of artist run spaces, Tiger, Tiger Strikes Asteroid, Good Naked, um, but also galleries. I worked with Denny Dimon Gallery, where you know you could buy a print from them for 125, 150 dollars. But like again, we run into the secrecy thing here, right? Which is I can totally afford to buy a print for 125 dollars from Denny Dimon. I can totally. I can walk into that gallery because I have a certain amount of like confidence, and uh, I can. Look you have around. cool blue glasses. You're cool edgy. Blue glasses. Or... <laughs> I'm edgy. I'm cool. I, I own a bunch of art. I know what I'm talking about. I know the difference between a Picasso and a Matisse. But like, I walk into that gallery. There's art on the walls. Nothing ever has any price tags. How the hell am I supposed to know that there are prints here for, for sale for 125 bucks? It just I my my assumption walking into a space like that is that everything is twenty thousand dollars yeah same i hear you absolutely and i think i think that's where i would love to see the art industry change i mean look i gravitated towards people like elizabeth and rob who ran denny dimmon gallery who did list their prices you know who were excited to sell someone their first 
piece of artwork. As Rob himself said, like, we need to see the industry open up to survive. I think for me, this book is part journey to learn how to live life more expansively and part a user guide to the hidden logic of the art world. And I really got a crash course in it in a way that was utterly disorienting at first. But I do think that, you know, what I what I learned was, I could say, um, I did have this experience early on in my time working as an assistant of, of realizing that I was not crazy for feeling like the art world was alienating because I was beginning to understand all of the techniques that the art world adopted to essentially be alienating. It's strange. I mean, it's strange to me that you could run a gallery and profess to want to show art that will change the world and yet locate your gallery in such a way that you also seek to discourage, you know, quote unquote, ground level foot traffic from coming inside. Yeah, heaven forfend the normies should even look at this art. <laughs> um, but I do think that I at least found it very empowering to at least understand the way the rules work, because then you can sort of invent your own. We have to take a break, but we'll be back after this. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Mint Mobile. This is a mobile company that has ditched retail stores, ditched a huge quantity of overhead costs, and they just sell their phone plans online. They pass the savings on to you, and for a limited time, they're passing on even more savings with a new customer offer that cuts all Mint Mobile plans to, get this, $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. Mint Mobile is here to rescue you with premium wireless plans for just 15 bucks a month. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. Bring your phone number, bring all your existing contacts. They have the nation's largest 5G network. And say bye-bye to overpriced wireless plans. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's limited time deal and get premium wireless service for just 15 bucks a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash slate money. That's mintmobile.com slash slate money. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash slate money. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Everyone has the checklist before they go out. Phone, wallet, keys. How does my hair look? But if your hair is thinning, you might not be so confident leaving the house. That's why you need to check out Hims. Hims is changing men's health care by providing simple and convenient access to science-backed treatments for erectile dysfunction, hair loss, weight loss, and more. The entire process is 100% online, so you can get a new routine of improving your overall health faster. Hims offers an array of high-quality options including pills or chews for ED and serum sprays or oral options for hair loss. If prescribed, your medication ships directly to you for free and in discreet packaging. No waiting rooms and no pharmacy visits. No insurance is needed. Pay one low price for your treatments, online visits, ongoing shipments, and provider messaging. You can even manage your plan on the Hims app, track progress, and learn more about your conditions and how to treat them from leading medical experts. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash money. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash money for your personalized treatment options. This show is brought to you by Discover. You know, in today's world, it seems the best treatment is reserved only for a few. Well, Discover wants to change that by making everyone feel special. That's why with your Discover card, you have access to 24-7 live customer service, as well as $0 fraud liability which means you're never held responsible for unauthorized purchases. Finally, no matter who you are or where you are in life, you'll feel special with Discover. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Limitations apply. Next question about buying the art of emerging artists. Big question. Is it important to buy art from galleries or is it just as good if not better to buy it directly from artists and they get a hundred percent of what you're spending so it depends and i think it's important to spell out within your question for those who don't know in general what happens is if you buy an artwork from a gallery 
Typically, the gallery will split the sale 50-50 with the artist. The proportions vary depending on the contract, depending on the artist, depending on where they are in their career. But that's the sort of industry standard, which is a big cut, right? The gallery takes a big cut. Now, of course, you can also buy artwork from artists directly. But again, it depends. I mean, galleries are part of the ecosystem. Certainly, it's not a perfect ecosystem. But nonetheless, like, I do think that you should feel very good about buying a piece of art through a gallery, even if the gallery takes 50 percent and gives 50 percent to the artist. And that's because galleries play a crucial role in this ecosystem. For one thing, they are places that are open to the public where an artist's work gets to exist sort of in the public sphere. And that is very important for an artist, for a career. They play a key role in sort of helping to steward and shepherd artists' careers. And so I do think that, um, you know, buy th- buy from the galleries, buy from the artists, buy art every day of the week, however <laughs> you can buy it. <laughs> oh, no. And buy it, but buy it, you know. And, We're halfway and, through Tuesday and I haven't bought yeah, the art yet. Yeah, hurry. <laughs> so then the next question is, if it's great to art, buy art from artists and it's great to buy art from galleries, what about buying art in what is known in the industry as the secondary market? Mm-hmm. Buying art either at auction or from a dealer who's, you know, bought it from someone else who's, you know, has it on consignment from someone else who'd bought it. Basically, an art where 0% is going to the artist rather than either 50 or 100%. Is that generally a bad thing to do because then you're really not supporting the artist at all? Look, I'm not here to say that there's any bad way of buying art. I mean, you know, like... The art world has enough rules as it is. Like, I'm not here to make new ones. (laughs) I think that it is important to understand how the flow of money happens in those situations. Um, So, for example, while I was working with Julie, I was there at a really interesting point in her career where she was going from sort of a more emerging artist to someone who was skyrocketing in prominence and popularity. And it was this moment where her work was suddenly starting to sell for thousands of times more than it had initially. It was going, you know, there was a piece that she had earned about $600 for that while I was there sold for something like $400,000, of which she saw basically zero. Maybe, you know, depends, right? Some some auctions, I think in the UK and overseas, you know, have a, a clause that some percentage of the sale goes back to the artist. But still, it's, it's not 50% of the $400,000. And I think That's important to recognize that, you know, the artist is not seeing the financial upside directly from that sale. But they do see it indirectly, right? Like insofar as if I'm a collector and I want a Julie Curtis and I'm willing to pay $400,000 at auction, then presumably I'm willing to pay at least $150,000 fresh off the canvas. Right. Certainly. Right. And that's why I think what's very interesting is that there is this almost like a scary story repeated around a campfire that gets repeated over and over in the art world, which is this idea of when a young artist's work starts selling very quickly for a lot of money, that this is the first symptom of a terminal disease that's infected their career. Essentially, your career will be like a souffle and and sort of collapse, right? That collectors, as many gallerists like to repeat, are sheep, that they will look around and they will see that people who have just bought Uh, an artwork a year or two before are flipping it very quickly um, because they don't believe in the longevity of an artist's career. They essentially say, "Okay, like this seems like the high of the market. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to get out now. And I don't believe that this artist has longevity. By the same token, you know, if the person who is selling it doesn't believe in the longevity or maybe they're just selling it because of, you know, one of the three D's, death, divorce, debt, um, you know, and they have to sell it because they need the money. But by the same token, there's a buyer, right? There's a buyer out there who really wants that painting so much that they're willing to spend an insane amount of money on it. That's got to be a huge vote of confidence. Right. And I came to think that this fear was somewhat overblown. There's this notorious story of an artist whose work started selling for, you know, exploded in value, but then suddenly no one wanted to buy it on the secondary market. And, you know, he had retired because he could no, at the ripe old age of 46, because He could no longer afford his studio, and people described it as a career wipeout. Fast forward, you know, I look into this artist. He's still making work. He's still represented by galleries. As far as I can tell, he is still selling work on the primary market. And I think that this goes back to this very complicated relationship that the art world has with money where 
um, as one person described it to me, you know, it's considered somewhat distasteful, right, for art to be selling for too much money in the minds of certain curators and and trying to build up the value, the monetary value of an artwork in a way that sort of appears accidental, but is, of course, highly calculated. So, so th- this is this comes at the core of what I think of as the contemporary art market. We had Julia Halperin on this show uh, a couple of years ago talking about the art market, and she basically came out with, the I think, the most important number that you need to know in the art world, which is $500,000. That That is the point, and if there is any, obviously these things are fuzzy, but more or less, roughly speaking, $500,000 is when art starts becoming investment grade. $500,000 is when you start expecting art to retain its value and it starts to become an asset class. Below that, it's a consumption good. You've spent your money, you own a painting, and you know that's that. But what you do find in a large number of galleries selling art for much less than $500,000 is this idea that prices only go up. If they represent an artist, every time that artist has a show, the price has to go up a little bit from the last one. The price can never go down. That There is this kind of convention about pricing, which is super important. No one ever prices off quality. No one ever says, you know, there are eight paintings in this show, and obviously this one's the best, so this one costs more. No, they all cost the same, and then we place the best one with the collector that we want to, you know, kiss up to the most. Right. Where place means sold, just to translate, yes. <laughs> and, and possibly even, you know, give them a 20% discount because we really want them to own the piece and so on and so forth. But there is this financialization of art as an asset well below, but below the $500,000 range where galleries are really worried about, like, this idea that art might fall in value. It turns out, as your anecdote shows, or you can just look at someone like Damien Hirst, who's a really prime example, you know, his auction prices probably peaked in 2008. Doesn't matter. He's still making hundreds of millions of pounds selling art to people who want to buy it. You know, it, he doesn't need a secondary market. And you can be a successful artist, and you can, have a, you can be a successful artist with a volatile market, which goes up and down. But there is this fear of volatility. I think you've captured a you know a key part of the market and a key reason that we buy art, right? Which is there is this idea underpinning all of the lofty talk about mark making and you know spatial and non spatial and and all these you know kind of heady terms is this sort of unspoken agreement I think that often occurs between a buyer and a gallery that like they're going to spend money for this thing and. That money is not going to go away. They're going to, you know, this artwork is going to appreciate in value and they're going to be able to see that many that money back on the back end, even though that may never be said. Yeah, I mean, for, for bigger galleries, certainly they do have an unwritten rule that if you do want to sell it, then they will probably buy it back from you at least for the amount that you paid originally. Maybe. Small galleries don't do that because they can't afford to. Right. Look, I'm I'm not in the business of buying 500,000 paintings, so I can't speak for that mentality and, and, you know, the sweat on your palms going into that decision. But what I will say is let's not forget that an investment is really only one of the reasons to buy an artwork, right? It's the worst possible reason <laughs> to buy an artwork. Like, I was really struck by the way that Julie and her husband, the artist Clinton King, live with artwork. And I would... While I was working in Julia's studio, I would go home to her apartment for lunch. And I realized that, like, my idea of living with art was all wrong. I mean, I had been thinking in this, like, narrow, very pitiful way, which is this idea that, like, you know, you kind of fill the space over the couch and you stop when all the walls have a thing on them. And Julie and Clinton, I mean, their art was everywhere. I mean, it was over the range on the stove. It was over the clock, over the window. It was, you know, I remember going to go pee in her bathroom and I peed with like with my butt in a sculpture on the toilet tank with my elbow in a painting, you know, being watched over by painting on the medicine cabinet, staring at another one on the wall across from me. And it was just, it was alive. It was dynamic. It was exciting. It was like living with all these rambunctious roommates. And there's this term in the art world um, that gets thrown around rather dismissively of couch art. 
right? And couch art is synonymous with colorful painting. And it gets uttered with a lot of disdain, right? Like colorful painting. It's like, oh, it's this is the pretty thing. It's the easy to sell thing. It's well, couch what, what, art. I need, I need to jump in here for for people who don't speak art world and explain that the word painting is often couched in derision. Right, sort of synonymous like, with like <laughs> capitalism. and Painting is the most boring and capitalist and bourgeois form of art. Right, right. And colorful painting is the, the <laughs> most, you know, in this, in this taxonomy. But really, you know, as another artist put it to me, like people deride the idea of an artwork hanging over your couch, but it's a damn beautiful thing, right? This idea that you're looking at this piece day in, day out, and it's seeping into your consciousness is incredible and magical. And I think that that could happen with a Van Gogh print of sunflowers, or that could happen with a weird ceramic sculpture of a guy jacking off with his hand in a bag of Cheetos, which is a a piece that, against my wildest expectations, I ended up falling in love with when I saw it at the Spring Break Art Fair. Bianca Bosca, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. This has been amazing. It was a pleasure. newly renewed with a with the joy of looking. Many thanks to Jared Downing for producing this here show. And we will be back on Saturday with a regular slate money. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.